but I think I'm now ready to proceed yeah, well, with my next step. Yeah, with uh, in Calgary, Alberta, yeah, it's, it's it's a you know it's been way below zero here for a long time. So oh yeah, yeah Boy, it is, it we're all brutal. coming out. Yeah, it's going to uh, be. I know, I'm looking forward to maybe being able to sit out on the the back porch here, but March actually is the snowiest month for really? us. Yeah, we get more snow typically in March. Not always. It's weird. You just can't predict the weather around here. Well, yeah, you but, get you make up for it with that little uh, like the most beautiful place on earth for about four months, four or five months. You know. Yeah. Well. Um, it's um, you know it's, it's it's similar to Montana for sure, and you know the funny, the interesting thing about it is um, to tell you the truth, Montana is more rustic than Alberta. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's interesting. And when you go south, to me, it's actually getting wilder in many respects. But anyway, it's oh, yeah. You get into Glacier National Park, and then that. What's what's the name of that? Is it Flathead Lake and yeah, like, right. by yeah. Kalispell well, and yeah, it's, the population of Montana is nine hundred thousand people, and it's a pretty big state. The city of Calgary itself is uh, the the greater area is one point two million. So we have more people in my city than all of Montana. Mm. Yeah, and plus you got Ed, how that. far is Edmonton? Edmonton is a, is about a three hour drive. Up, uh, up the divided highway from me, and uh, it's a it's a city of about a million people as well. So I anyway, um, Montana is very rustic, and uh, I've yeah, so occasions that I've been are a little bit crazier too. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'll leave that for you to say. <laughs> you know, but, uh, yeah, we uh, we've enjoyed a couple of trips down there, and uh, Helena, where Tim lives, is a really interesting. Little city, little city. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. It's I, that drive to Beautiful. Helena is one of like I've told Tim many times. It's one of my favorite drives in the whole world. Hi, Annette and uh, uh, Carlos. Just getting started here. Uh, this is going to be a great book. I mean, it's it's going to combine. Um, you you know uh, Tim you did that thing on the great mother uh, recently, and uh, it just combines the the fact that the mother wants her child to flourish, and yet she doesn't want him to ever leave her. You know, so it's this this double aspect, and it's just going to be so beautifully illustrated here. And uh, I thought I'd start out with this uh, little sure you've heard it but this is from Wordsworth you know there was a time when meadow grove and stream the earth and every common sight to to me did seem appareled in celestial light the glory and the freshness of a dream it is now as it is not now as it hath been of yore turn wherever I may by night and day the things I have seen I can see no more our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life star, has had elsewhere its setting, and it cometh from afar, not in entire forgetfulness and not in utter nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come from God who is our home. Heaven lies about us in our infants, infancy. But then this is the tragedy of everybody's life the shades of the prison house begin to close upon the growing boy. And at length, the man perceives it die away and fade into light of common day. And uh, that's really is, is what's illustrated in, in the Puer Eternus. It is a neurosis, but it's, 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 the, it's the combination of how do we bring the magic of youth into adulthood? You know, how do you do that? And it's not easy, you know, I mean, and uh, yet it's the tragedy is that some people who have totally committed to the magic of youth are not 
going to let it go because they have to make too many compromises in the adult world, you know? And so then they end up like Peter Pan living in the land where children never grow up. And it's also a very common um, uh, uh, problem with, with men in the last century and a half, you know, in particular, I was a Pueri turn. It's like, I, uh, uh, you know, I did analysis for 14 years and I was talking to an analyst from France and, and uh, she said, well, what did you learn at this Jungian analysis? You know, and then I said, well, I started it just to do for pedagogical reasons, but then I found out I really had a problem. And uh, she said, oh, well, what, what was that? And I said, I found out I was a Poeri Turnus. And then she kind of looks at my wife and says, well, what is a Poeri Turnus? And then her nine-year-old daughter who can speak uh, English, French, and Spanish lives in Paris, plays the French horn and sings in French opera says, uh, um, says, uh, oh, that means eternal child in Latin. <laughs> so, anyway, that was kind of my story. But uh, anyway, uh, so now just my wife says, well, what's the origin of the, of the word? Okay, well, the, the first time it's mentioned is in uh, Ovid's Metamorphoses, you know, which if you know anything about Joseph Campbell, it's must reading, you know, and... Uh, uh, it was spoken of the of the child god Iacus. Um, he was a poer eternus, an eternal divine child, and praising him for his his role in the uh, mother cult mysteries, which are going to tie in with this problem uh, of the uh, of the Eleusinian mysteries, were a, really a mother cult, and uh, and the this child god Iacus. Uh, Iacus was actually what they yell, they would yell out at midnight, Iacus, you know, at, at the time. It, and this really represented Christmas Eve. It, it represented the birth of life, you know, and, and then there became a God that was associated with the cry called Iacus, but he was identified with Dionysus and, and the God Eros. So it's this divine youth born in the night, uh, which is typical in mother cult mysteries. He, he's a redeemer, a God of vegetation and resurrection because he's the child of the great mother. And he corresponds to Tammuz, Addis, and Adonis. And by the way, Tammuz was born on, on the uh, 20, December 25th too, you know, and he's, He's always been very closely uh, related to uh, Jesus. I mean, if you look there, what's that on Tammuz's uh, chest there? You know, this is uh, Babylonian Tammuz. Anyway, it's kind of uh, gives you the, uh, makes you uh, have uh, goose pimples. But uh, so anyway, the Pueriternus is also used to indicate men with an outstanding mother complex and who behave in certain typical ways. You know, they don't can know I, that. Can, yeah, go ahead. Can I ask something or say something? Uh, is, it, is that similar to what um, I heard it uh, once that Tony Wolf thought that a lot of females actually have an animus with a Pueriternus? Yes, uh, See, did, it's did one step that? removed. You're yeah. correct. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The, mm -hmm. the Puella Eternus mm -hmm. <laughs> has an animus who is a Puer, you know. So her guiding principle is the divine you. So she is also participates. Everything we're hearing here applies to the feminine uh, eternal youth as it does to the masculine, but it usually is tied in more. And that's wonderful in that, that uh, um, Tony Wolf tied it in with the animus because that's true. The animus of the poella is a poer. And so her uh, guiding uh, principle is this eternal child who never grows up. And in all her dreams, that's where she would normally see young men rather than, um, you know, 
uh, Merlin or some wise old man, you know, but um, it, it's just it, it, the, the problem is that now, now, first of all, she's going to mention some of the negative characteristics of a power, you know, but they also have a lot of positive characteristics, but, you know, um, and they can get over it. There is a cure and it's a one word and I'll tell you in a second. Well, I'll tell you right now, I can't keep a secret. Work, <laughs> that's the cure. And uh, Young says, is it really as simple as that? And he says, yeah, I think it is. You know, the, the cure for the puer archetype is to work. And you know, of course you're gonna move into the, what, what the problem is though, that you lose, you lose your devils, but you also lose your angels too. So it's, it's, a, it's, very interesting. This whole thing is such a beautiful mystery, and uh, it is not easy. You know, I mean, well, I, I'm not saying it's hard, but it is a ever flowing mystery. You'll never be able to pin it down because it's too valuable to let go of. You know, but it it's too um, uh, it, it's too isolating and escapism to live a provisional life, which, uh, you know, the problem with the puer is he leads what's called a provisional life, you know, in the land where children never grow up. And his, he has no history. And it only, he, he, he intersects with history at one point on the circle. So he's tangential to it, you know. Uh, so, but it, it's how do you enter the adult world and not lose the magic of you? Uh, is the is the thing because then then you enter the Senex world and of course every fairy tale what is the problem? It is that you have an adult world that is um, is la has la lacks enchantment of nature and and magic. You know it's just totally dead of of spirit or. Um, or the magic, I think is a better word because it's it's more related to the mother than it is the eros than logos. It's just that wonderful charm of poetry, you know. Um, so um, anyway, they uh, their libido gets tied up with the mother. Uh, they uh, it's really their only beloved object. Now these are all the negative uh, parts. It actually um, later becomes uh, more. Um, We'll get into the more beautiful aspects of it. Um, that would make the other woman a rival of the mother. And uh, uh, it, it, everything, um, it, the, 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 the man is looking for the mother goddess, you know, not for a, a real living woman, you know. So uh, Every time he's fascinated by a woman, he must discover that she's an ordinary person. And once he's been intimate with her, the whole fan, uh, fascination vanishes and he turns away disappointed. And he only, pro only to project this anew on one woman and after another. And uh, it's, uh, he's, he has a great a difficulty in adapting to social situations has a false individualism. Um, he thinks he's something special, has no need to adapt. And it would be impossible for me to adapt anyway, because I'm a hidden genius, you know? And he's got an arrogant attitude due to a, a combination of an inferiority complex and a feeling of superiority over everyone else, you know? Um, now don't get too down on the puer though here. I'm gonna, but such people have great difficulty in finding a right kind of job. Whatever they find is not right. It's not what they wanted. There's always a hair in the soup. The woman is never the right woman. She's nice as a girlfriend, but um, there's always something that, always something that prevents commitment. Def uh, they, they won't commit to anything. So um, it, it's the provisional life. And uh, it, it is um, uh, an inner refusal to commit oneself to this moment uh, with 
the the uh, it has a, a secret thought that one day they will be able to save the world, that they possess the last word in philosophy, religion, politics, or art, or something else. And uh, my father described it in me as delusions of grandeur. <laughs> he told me I had delusions of grandeur, which was probably true. And uh, one thing to be dreaded throughout by such a man is to be uh, bound to anything whatever. And there's just terrific fear of being pinned down of entering space and time completely. And this is true and of the hetera, you know, uh, actually Tony Wolf was no, was called a hetera, but it's it's uh, someone who does not want to be pinned down by uh, anything. You know, they, they live a, a, uh, a, a very uh, independent, liberated life. You know, and that's that's an important part of the prayer is they're so are so free, you know. Um the uh we'll we'll find that in uh the um in in the uh, uh in in when when we get to the next book. See the book we're reading right now is uh gonna be the little prince, but later we're gonna get to uh the kingdom without space. And uh, it's just uh, has a wonderful speech by the Senex who says um, that these free people must be stopped. You know, they must be crushed. We must find them where they sleep, you know, and uh, stop them. You know, I mean, this is, this, is the, this is the common day world talking about the magic kingdom, you know. And uh, so anyway, um, uh, the uh, it can go far as megalomania, and uh, but there, it's uh, the symbolism. Symbolism usually has to do in in a where uh, Peter Pan flies everywhere. He doesn't walk; he flies. You know, they are, are they escape and try to go as high as possible away from reality, away. From the earth so they are air beings they tend to be mountaineers or pilots and uh, many die in airplane cat crashes in mountaineering accidents because when they get to be about 30 they start to say wait this isn't working you know and then so there's this kind of hidden resistance and uh, the hidden resistance eventually leads them into a uh, sort of a car crash type situation or a, a plane crash situation or something. Craig. Yes, go ahead. I'm, as you're saying this, I'm being reminded of a couple of examples. Um, first is, are the people who put on those wing suits and jump off mountain cliffs and go flying oh. down, have you ever seen that? Yes, I mean, they- It's uh, crazy. And, you know, in where I come from, I just, or our, my father just lives maybe eight or nine miles from what's called Trollwegen, which is the Troll Wall, which okay. is about a mile over the valley floor. Cliff. Yeah. And that's one of the places, uh, it's the second highest rock wall in, in Europe. I think there's a higher one in the Alps, but hi, Marina and, and Russell and Carl, just hi, getting hi. started here. Okay, um, so, hi. you know, yeah, hi, Carl. Yeah, They're, the positive qualities of such a youth is they have a kind of spirituality which comes from relatively close contact with the unconscious. And they have the charm of youth and, and the stirring quality of being slightly tipsy, with, like you've just drank champagne. And they're very agreeable to talk to have interesting things to talk about and have an invigorating effect. They don't like conventional situations. They ask deep questions and go straight for the truth. You know, uh, I have a cousin who's a poor eternist. He, he, he'll, he'll come up to you like about an inch from your nose and he said, okay, dish, you know, <laughs> tell me everything, you know, and, uh, so uh, anyway, um, they uh, usually 
they are uh, searching for the genuine religion. And this is something that's typical uh, for people in their late teens. And the, uh, but the youthful charm of the Pueri Turnus is usually prolonged through the late stages of life. Uh, now, there is another uh, type of puer, and then we're going to get, we'll be done talking with about the neuro, ne neurosis of the puer. And that is uh, the one who lives in a sleepy daze, who's sleepy, undisciplined, long legged youth who merely hangs around, mind wandering indiscriminately, indiscriminately, so you feel inclined to dump a bucket of cold water on their head, you know. They don't display the charm of eternal youth, uh, nor does the archetype of eternal youth shine through them. But the sleepy days is usually just their outer aspect, because if you look into it, you find that they are, they do have a, uh, some kind of cherished fantasy life within, uh, within them. And uh, of course, then um, uh, the, um, what, what anyway it it comes to uh the uh the the fact of being in the mother's nest too long sometimes is the problem but it's also has to do with if you remember eric neumann's diagram with the devouring mother you know you've got the devouring mother you got the great mother you got then then you have sophia the wisdom goddess and then you have the other axis the anima and then you have the young witch who is the transforming feminine of addiction, you know, whether it's alcohol, drugs, sex, money, anything. And then on the other pole, you have the transforming aspect of the, of the anima who is the bridge to the other world and takes the center of gravity of the ego and gradually moves it to the middle plane, to the philosopher's stone, to the temple of wisdom, where the inner world and the outer world, these opposites can dialogue, you know, one to one in real time, you know, and that's what the purpose of active imagination is too, you know, and it's called, it's also the second conjunctio, you know, I don't know if there's too many people that have gotten to the final Kanyang show, but anyway, it's the union of the inner and outer worlds. So um, anyway, is there a cure? If you can discover that you're aware, is there a cure? And Young says, yes, it is work. But w work is the dis most disagreeable word a Puer uh, ever has heard because it's commitment you know, to a conventional life, you know. Now, um, just um, a little bit about um, uh, if a man pulls out of this kind of useful neurosis, it's through work, you know, and uh, uh, the e ego needs to first be sufficiently strengthened. And it's also a good idea to find out where your energy flow is so that maybe if you have to work, that you're going to work uh, in a direction where there might be a little bit of enthusiasm. You know, it's a, of course easier to train yourself to work in a direction supported by one's nature and one's instinct. So it's not quite so hard. So anyway, um, that's kind of the description of the, uh, you know, basically uh, the uh, cry of the uh, Puer is, this is not it. Let's switch to something else. Whatever we're doing is not working. You know, I mean, whatever it is, is not the answer. You know, there's this constant um, impatience uh, with, with reality and because it's so easy to escape. You know, I can fly up away from reality. I don't need to stay down here with you guys and be annoyed by your, uh, what annoys me, you know, uh, which, um, uh, we'll find out as he calls uh, uh, bridge politics and neckties, you know, and money, you know, that's the adult world as far as he saw it. So anyway, uh, we're going to read about the little prince and it's by Antoine de Saint Exupéry. Exupéry. Uh, Annette, can you pronounce that any better than me? 
uh, exu. It's it's like pari, but I'm not really good on the exu pari. Exu pari. I think I it's probably exu pari. You know. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, the, it just sheds so much light, and and plus the fact it is the most beautiful and surprising book you've ever read. Now he died in a World War II plane crash in 1944, at, just about the time France was liberated, and uh, which and his death displays all this typical signs of war, you know. But he was a great writer and a poet. And his life was pretty difficult to trace, which is not which is typical. Um, he came from an aristocratic French uh, family. His father was a very uh, no, rich nobleman. Uh, here's his childhood house. I don't know if you can. That's a pretty nice house. That was, and it's in a, it's a in the French countryside, so it's it's just very very charming, you know, and uh, uh, he uh, came from a, a group of uh, several children. He's the second from the right. And his brother was the favored son in the family uh, by the mother who was quite a, uh, she was quite a, she lived until 1972, by the way. And she was quite a woman herself. She, uh, um, you know, uh, wrote many um, poet. Po uh, she did a lot of painting, a lot of drawing, and of course, that's important because uh, <laughs> he, uh, somebody who wrote, it's it actually in in a book called Aviation History, uh, wrote uh, that um, he was. Uh, he, the cloak of motherhood hang, hung around him. And as he got older, he pulled it closer to himself. And, uh, uh, you know, so he was a uh, um, real, um, I think he was born in 1900, I believe. And uh, he married, um, and it wasn't a very happy marriage, but this beautiful, uh, Salvadoran French woman whose name was Consuela, you know, but um, they uh, um, didn't get along that great, you know. Uh, let me see, I got a picture of them together, but uh, this is a beautiful picture of her and him, you know. If you look at most of the pictures of him with her, though, I don't know, I'm, I'm most, I saw two. Uh, he seems to always be looking down. He doesn't really uh, look, but but he's quite a interesting character. I mean, there's nothing about him that is uh, boring at all. You know, I mean, he's just uh, so fascinating. But anyway, so um, he, uh, you, you know, he started flying for the post office, uh, which is called the Aero Postal. He flew from South America to Europe. He flew um, also to North Africa, Toulouse and Dakar and Buenos Aires. He was, uh, he was uh, stranded for cons a considerable time in the North African desert uh, in the Sahara. And uh, he's actually stranded there, but he also worked there. His main duty was to rescue pilots who crashed. It's almost a thousand miles of sand and uh, it was a, just this wonderful job and he would just go out and rescue pilots who crashed. And in um, 1939, he fought as a captain in the Air Force, but then France fell in 1940. He moved to New York and he started, uh, uh, finished some books there. And then when the Allies landed in Africa, he returned to the Air Force and was refused because of his age. And in July, 1944, he left Algiers uh, with his plane on a reconnaissance mission, flight to France, and disappeared without trace of his plane or himself. There was a witness, a German, uh, who said that he was in a group of seven planes and that he they were in a, a Fokker Wolf, which is um, very similar to the plane he was flying, which was a P-38 Lightning. I think I might have a picture. 
No, this is it. Uh, no, this is the this is the plane he was flying. It was actually a French plane, but it was a what was called a P thirty eight, and uh, he was shot down. No one knew what happened to him, other than that German witness. But there is somebody. Uh, this guy in 1988 found his uh, bracelet, or 1998 found his bracelet uh, in a wreck on the ocean floor of his P-38, you know, so um, at least they know what happened to him now, you know, but um, anyway. Isn't it, isn't it very remarkable that they all die so tragically, so dramatically, you know, so in, in, in accidents, apparently? Well, yes, and Von Franz says this is on purpose because the unconscious is saying after they reach 30 and, and over, you must participate in the world. You cannot live this life anymore. But they do it anyway because they don't know anything else to do. This is the only thing they know how to do. But in their, in their consciousness, there is a resistance to doing this, and it suddenly uh, leads them to a little bit of absent-mindedness, either when they're mountaineering or flying, that usually leads to uh, crashes. Now, this was very early in the aviation industry when, uh, you know, one little mistake and you're gone. I mean, there's no of this, I don't even have to touch the controls, you know, from New York to uh, Frankfurt, you know, the plane does takes off, lands, and I don't have to do anything. I mean, this this was where it was real uh, live controls, you know, analog controls. So it was easy to have a lot more mistakes. And you find you still have this, and you'd probably know about this, Miles, in the bush pilots in Alaska and Canada, and uh, I know in northern Minnesota. They, there's a lot of accidents, you know, a lot, because they're a little more cheap planes and they're just so uh, dependent on your um, own abilities, you know. So anyway, let's um, uh, try to just get into the uh, uh, the little prints. Let's see if we can, I'm missing anything. Well, okay, well, I can tell you a little bit about the shadow of the, uh, of the Puer. You know, um, what, one of the things von Franz says about the book, he, that, that it's his most popular book, and it is so tremendously successful. And if you go to the internet, you'll find all kinds of websites devoted to either uh, X3 or to his book. And they, it, they just carry it around like it's a Bible. And they, but he says, she says, they have a kind of defiant attitude about it which kind of left a question mark in her mind and he thinks in their minds. And she thinks the question mark is that it has a slightly sentimental style. Now, sentimental is just a little bit fake feeling function, okay? It's the feeling function, but you know, uh, the, uh, it sort of expresses the animus or anima mood if a man is in an anima mood, uh, he can e either be very sentimental or very brutal, you know, and, and uh, so he's either displaying very false feeling. He's a thinking function person, you know, and he's displaying either very false feeling function or none at all, you know, so, and the, the, what she's saying is the fact that there was a slight sentimentality to the uh to the little prince just not not but but that the opposite of sentimentality uh and young said this too is just cold masculine brutality you know and that's the shadow side of the puer uh it compensates for its too unreal attitude of of consciousness so the shadow is unbelievably brutally realistic, you know, and with empty of all feeling, 
you know, there's no magic in the shadow of the puer. And so once the feeling has come out that you have this ice cold brutality with no feeling left in it. And uh, uh, this is why they can just, um, they'll just, they don't just, they don't let the other woman down easy. They just abandon her, you know? I mean, there's just this uh, aspect of, I'm done, you know, I have no feel, I'm empty of feeling. I'm moving on. Oh, well, she's, her feelings are hurt. Oh, well, you know, get over it you know, or something. You know, I mean, they're just very brutal. And uh, uh, it also kind of applies to money because they don't have jobs, but they tend to get money somehow. And usually it's through being a gigolo or something, you know. And uh, so um, anyway, um, that kind of covers the, uh, the, the, uh, aspects of the puer there's more but um why don't we just go on to the uh uh to the to the little prince um and and it starts out with uh i don't know i don't want to go too long i only got 20 minutes okay all right so um anyway um the uh, uh the the first part is autobiographical and it really is it is autobiographical because you don't know how much and and i'll tell you something else this book, like Zarathustra, Nietzsche's Zarathustra, seems to be written very um, unconsciously. I mean, it seems to be almost written like a dream. It doesn't seem very worked over. And uh, Ivan Franz thinks this too, that it is, is a real expression of the unconscious. So, and, and you'll find it so surprising that uh, he's either a fabulous writer or this is a, almost dreamlike, you know, so uh, anyway, it starts out, once when I was six years old, I saw a magnificent picture in a book called True Stories from Nature about the primeval forest. It was a picture of a boa constrictor in the act of swallowing an animal. And uh, in the book that said, boa constrictors swallow their prey whole without chewing it. After that, they are not able to move and they sleep through uh, the six months they need for digestion. And he pondered deeply then over uh, this. And after some work with the colored pencil, pencil, he succeeded in making his first drawing, my drawing number one, and it looked like this. And uh, by the way, this drawing, and we'll find out later, which looks just pretty ordinary, uh, has the entire mystery of his whole life in it. All right, it doesn't look like it has his entire mystery of his whole life in it, but it does. <laughs> We're gonna find out how, just in a second here. Okay, so uh, he showed his masterpiece to grown-ups and asked them uh, if the drawing, did the drawing frighten you? And they said, uh, and they said, uh, frightened? Why should anyone be frightened by a hat? And, uh, but his drawing was not a picture of a hat. It was a picture of a boa constrictor digesting an elephant. An elephant, you might ask. Why an elephant? There's a very important reason. We'll find out later here. Okay, so uh, the, uh, but since uh, the grown-ups were not able to understand it, he made another drawing. And here's his second drawing. Okay, there's the second drawing. Okay, uh, and the second drawing is, uh, um, is they, he made a, uh, I drew inside of the boa constrictor so the grownups could see the elephant clearly. They always need to have things explained. And uh, so uh, here it was, and the grownups response was to advise him to lay aside his drawings of boa constrictors, whether from inside or outside, and devote himself instead to geography, history, arithmetic, and grammar. And that is why at the age of six, he gave up what might have been a magnificent career as a painter. And he was disheartened. Uh, and uh, so then he chose another profession. He uh, learned to pilot airplanes. Okay. And uh, um, he'd flown over all the parts of the world and he could distinguish at a glance 
from China, China from Arizona. So his geography helped him out. And uh, uh, he, uh, he um, in the course of his life, he says, I have had great many encounters with a great many people who've been concerned with matters of consequence. I have lived a great deal among grown-ups. I have seen them intimately close at hand, and that hasn't much improved my opinion of them. Whenever I meet one of them who seemed to me at all clear-sighted, I tried my experience experiment of showing them drawing number one, which I always kept. I would then find out if this person was of true understanding. But they would always say, he or she, oh, that's a hat. Then, so I would never talk to this person about boa constrictors or primeval forests. Now, what, what they really are talking about, what he really wants them to understand is that he, his, his greater personality has been devoured by the mother archetype. He doesn't know that. Von Franz said he got pretty close to it, but he didn't know it. She said that he might have been, if he had met young, he might have at least knew some of this. It might have helped. But what he is disappointed in people understanding is that his personality has been devoured by the mother archetype. Now, isn't that amazing? So Russell is asking what that means. What what um, what what uh, means um, in the that, chat? I assume he's talking about the the being devoured by the mother goddess. Okay, devour, devoured by the mother archetype. Okay, well, I mean, essentially, it means um, that um, uh, it would be um, it, it's the um, old uh, witch. You know, it's the evil witch in the. Uh, all the fairy tales, the one that eats the, the children and cooks them in her oven, you know. And the idea is that um, uh, the un, uh, uh, our ego consciousness can't get out of the, um, the never, never land. It can't go into adult life. And so it's going to gradually, it, it, it is, uh, it, it, as this becomes more and more of a crisis, the unconscious starts to seep in and it threatens to overwhelm and drown ego, you know? And that's what it, it really means. I mean, what you, if you go all the way with the uh, Pueri Eternus until your late life and don't find any way to adapt to it, you are eventually going to be drowned in it. And, uh, you, you know, I don't, uh, I had air dreams. Charles, you have a few dreams too that are like this uh, uh, a little bit, you know, that they, there's just too much water, not enough land, you know. And uh, um, anyway, so that's what it means. Uh, it, and uh, it's just amazing. Don't you think it's just absolutely startling? that he drew this. And wait till you hear about the elephant because the elephant is just who exactly describes his personality. The characteristics of the elephant and him uh, are exactly the same. Um, I'm, I'm gonna open it up for questions at, uh, 40, uh, at 45 minutes, 13 minutes, but I'll just try to get through the rest of it here. Um, so uh, anyway, he's strand. He got stranded. Uh, his plane crashes, and he's uh, then suddenly he hears a voice, and it says, "If you please, draw me a sheep." He and it's this extraordinary little person, and he says, "If you please, would you draw me a sheep?" And that's where he meets the little prince. Okay, so. Um, now, he's been speaking about the emptiness and the idiocy and the meaninglessness of the adult world, uh, which he's never really gotten into. Uh, he, um, and the feeling tone of this is that child, childhood life, the imaginative life, the artist's life, that's the true life. And the rest is empty persona, running after money, making a prestige impression on other people, hearing, uh, having uh, 
lost one's true nature, so to speak. Well, that's true, too. I mean, that's what the uh, Wordsworth poem, you know, says. You know, I mean, it's uh, uh, this uh, at the end of that poem, you know, is the uh, uh, the uh, shades of the prison house begin to close upon the growing boy. The man perceives it die away and fade into light of common day. You know uh, that um, that we've lost the magic, and he's resisting. He's revolutionary resistance to this, you know, and he's not going to put up with it. But uh, at the same point, uh, the unconscious is making some pretty strong um, moves. This hat is one thing, you know, and. Uh, um, so how can you pull out of the fantasy life of youth and youthfulness without losing its value? How can one grow up without losing the feeling of totality and the feeling of createdness of being really alive, uh, which one had in youth, and, uh, and not uh, fall into disillusionment and cynicism? And uh, uh, so he rightly protests against it and clings to his inner artistic life, and uh, he sees quite well how in a subtle way he mocks the adult world and how to the point uh, it is, but at the same time does not know how to pull out of his childhood world without falling in the disillusionment of what he sees as the only value in adult life. So if you combine this with the symbolism in the picture, it becomes even worse because the boa constrictor obviously is an image of the devouring mother and in a deep sense, the devouring aspects of the unconscious, the one that, that suffocates life and pre prevents the human being from development and growth. So in other words, you're permanently in the womb. You never leave the womb. So if you don't leave the womb, you've been devoured by the mother. I mean, you never have left her protective shell to go into the adult world. And that's the meaning of the hero journey. And that's the meaning of the elephant. The elephant is the greatest hero in Africa, you know? And that is his individuated self that did enter the adult world, you know? I mean, the, the, the choice of symbols here is just absolutely stunning, you know? Uh, so uh, you could say the boa constrictor re represents a pull towards death, you know? And uh, the animal which is swallowed is an elephant, um, you know, and uh, he goes on, he tells all the characteristics of an elephant, but, um, you know, uh, basically they are uh, generous, intelligent, taciturn, moody, and get into rages, which can only <laughs> be uh, uh, appeased by music, not by sensual pleasures. And amazingly, these were the, also the outstanding qualities of, of ex, exupery. So that is an, the elephant is an exact picture of his character. He was very subtle. He was chaste to a certain extent, at least in being sensitive in his feelings, very ambitious, very sensitive about everything affecting his own honor. And he's continually on the search for religious satisfaction. Didn't worship God or he'd never found him, but he was always on the search, generous, intelligent, taciturn, but irritable and inclined to terrible moods and fits of rage. So in the elephant, there is an amazing self-portrait and one sees the archetypal pattern illustrated in a, in a simple individual uh, w without even much different. I mean, it's just absolutely stunning. And the, elef uh, the fact that that's what's being swallowed by the snake and that's exactly what um, uh, ex Upari's problem is, and it's why his plane crash in 1944, as Annette pointed out. And so the elephant is the model fantasy of, for, of a grown-up's uh, hero, and it's the, it's the image in his soul of, um, of what his soul wanted to become and is swallowed back by the devouring mother. So the elephant is the image in his soul of what he wanted to become. And it's swallowed back by the devouring mother. And it shows the whole tragedy in a nutshell. You know, uh, so, um, and we're not even into the book. Yet. And, and very often childhood dreams anticipate the interfaith 20 or 30 years ahead. 
And so this first picture shows the hero aspect, alive and constellated, uh, that um, uh, has, uh, has never quite come through, but it's swallowed back by regressive tendencies of the unconscious uh, and later by death. And the devouring mother myth is, uh, um, uh, could be pinned down with his own mother. She goes through that a little bit. Okay, um, and which we already saw her mother, his mother, and I don't really know much about that. We might hear later about it. I, I'm, I was going to try to do a little reading about his mother, but his mother was uh, quite a figure. And okay, so now we're going back to the book, and the book, and the and the little prince says, "Draw me in a sheep." He jumps to his feet, and he uh, draw draw. First of all, he drew this picture of uh, of. Uh, the little prince, you know, that was later. But anyway, this he draws, he tries to draw three sheep. I'll, I'll try to get to the chase here. Okay, he draws, he draws the first sheep and it's too sickly. Okay, then the second sheep, he says his friend uh, smiles at him indulgently and gently and says, well, now we can both see that that's not a sheep. It's got horns, it's a ram, you know? And so then he draws uh, the next sheep, uh, the third one, and uh, uh, he says, this one's too old. I want a sheep that will live a long time, you know? And so now here, the puer comes through. Uh, so finally, he draws this box, and uh, he tells him, this is only his box. The sheep you asked for is inside. And I was very surprised to see a light break over the face of my young judge. That's exactly the way I wanted it. Do you think, oh, I forgot to, to uh, tell you uh, the, the most amazing thing, is uh, at, when he, he tells him to draw a sheep, First, I forgot. I'm sorry, I left this out. This is this is the most amazing part of the whole thing. He he um, when when the little prince tells him to draw a sheep, he says he, he didn't know how to draw a sheep, and uh, uh, he says, uh, um, you know, uh, he says I don't care. Draw a sheep. So then he draws his hat, and he shows the little prince the hat. Now he's been shown the hat to everybody. Nobody. Everybody tells him he's nuts. You know, it's a hat. And, and the little prince looks at, no, I don't want a boa constrictor that swallowed an elephant. He says, it's the one person now, he's spent his whole life not being able to find anybody who knows what the hat is. The prince knows immediately. It's not, it's just the hat. He says, I don't want a boa constrictor that swallowed an elephant. I want a sheep. Now, see, this automatically is the magical being. How did he know that, you know? So anyway, uh, then uh, the, the typical puer, he's, he's getting impatient. So he draws in a box and uh, then um, he says, uh, and he wants to know uh, if, it's, if he's gonna eat a lot of grass. And he says, no, I, the, ship, the sheep I um, drew, uh, drew for you is very small. He says, well, he's not too, well, he's gone to sleep, he says. So anyway, uh, that's kind of the magical uh, <laughs> part of that. I, I screwed that up, I'm sorry, that's the, that's the best part. Okay, so anyway, um, uh, then um, he, uh, we, we get to kind of the uh, end of this thing uh, that um, uh, he, he, he gets impatient. And what happens is he, um, now he did, she tells the story too of when he was actually lost in, in the desert. But um, whenever a puer gets tired of something, they just put, a, put it in a box and put a lid on it. You know, all their messes. They take their mess, put it in a box, put a lid on it, put it in the closet or put it in the basement. You know, that's how they clean up their messes. You know, and that's what he's doing here. And it's this, this fact that they can't stick to uh, anything, you know, uh, uh, and uh, 
but let me see. We just got like uh, a couple of minutes left. I'll just try this last bit. Um, the um, it's it's very significant that the prince was the only one to understand drawing number one. The other side understands him. You know, James Hillman says, "Don't worry, you don't understand the dream. The dream understands you." So. The little prince is the unconscious. He understands X through three. And uh, the other, other side understands him. Is his first companion that he's met that understands it. And yet he's impatient, thinks the drawing's a nuisance. And uh, then he does, he puts it in a box. So um, his, her experience is um, if you analyze a man of this type, you, you can't, uh, she says that the only thing that is important is to take the, something seriously. She doesn't care what it is, a child, a job, or just take the, in, your dreams seriously, but don't stick to it. Don't give up, you know? Uh, and she says, uh, if you analyze a man of this type, whether you force him to take the outer world or the inner world seriously is unimportant. The important thing is that he should stick out whatever he's doing because he puts puts it in a box and puts a lid on it. That's his way of handling everything. But he can't. He has to just be very thorough in drawing the sheep. He has to keep drawing the sheep until the little prince says it's okay. So the most important thing is to do something seriously, whatever it is. The greatest danger of a puer is to put whatever it is he's doing in a box and put a lid, lid on it in a gesture of boredom and impatience. Suddenly uh, um, you have another plan uh, and this is not what you're looking for, which is the battle cry of the poer. Always do uh, it at the moment when it looks most difficult, whenever it's most difficult, uh, if you can get through it, the battle is won. So anyway, that is just the first little part of the Puer Eternus, and, and uh, it's going to get a lot more exciting. So anyway, um, do, does anybody have any questions, or have they had any experience with the Puer? Uh, Gary, how about you? Well, I've got a question about, about the little prince in that, because, you know, so he gets tired of drawing the sheep, and so then... He, you know, almost like the trickster, draws the box and like, oh, the sheep you want is in there. Which you know, I, I just love that. That was great. <laughs> but but the little prince is like, oh yes, you know, and he yeah, goes that's exactly the goes sheep I wanted. It. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. yet we know that that was like, you know, that was the impatience can't stick through with it, can't you know figure out what is the right sheep. So what was the significance of the little prince? You know, he's the of, dream maker. Oh, the dream maker. He's yeah. the unconscious. He knows right. him intimately. Everything he does, he's he just understands. He understands. He understands. God, oh, of course. He knows exactly course. what's going on. That's why. That's why he saw the snake and the python yeah. and knew it was the elephant within. Well, yeah, and he knows. He says, "Oh, yeah, this is what you do with everything. That's exactly what I wanted you to do, Antoine. Now let's deal with that." You know, I mean, so it's this really is a healing. This is a the healing animal helper in the fairy tale. Oh, that's so his, cool. His, his <laughs> little, the little prince, the character, and he's, he's the one that always appears when the break's about to happen, you know, uh, in anything. And uh, uh, so anyway, uh, that's what's going to kind of happen in the rest of this. Uh, what, what do you think? Uh, do you have any comments, Tim, or? No, but it, it's fascinating stuff. It is. It's just and exciting. It, it seems really like is. it's like that. The prayer Eternus is something that um, is a chapter in all of our growing up, and sometimes it's longer than others. But I'm recognizing parts of my own history in in all of this that we're talking about. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah, and it, it, the magical aspect of it too is something that we need to keep in even when we're old. And Annette, what do you, how are you uh, taking all this? 
Yeah, I find it really fascinating. And it also reminds me of a little bit of, um, you know, Stanislav Prof often wrote about the birthing process and as if, he, as if he's stuck in one of those phases, you know. Um, there's one phase that you um, constantly have to do very dramatic things, like very, uh, you know, sens sensational things as a repetition to be alive, almost as a feeling of being alive. You have to go into these enormous things rather than the mundane life, you know, the normal day-to-day -day life. And um, yeah, I, I could see so could see the link with addictions there. And uh, I mean, we all have a bit of it. Yes, I, I, I recognize that, yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Well, that, that, that talk about the sensation uh, aspect, uh, you know, I just felt like there was a meditation gong ringing while you're talking. I could feel it in my muscles and arms and bones because that's very close. Stanislav Grof. And of course, I was also thinking when you talked about the birthing process and getting stuck is we have a lot of dreams of people getting stuck in something like the umbilical cord. And that's kind of where the poer is stuck. He hasn't even got out of the womb into the, or into the uh, birth canal, not the umbilical cord, but the birth canal, you know, uh, sorry about my biology there. Car Carlos, do you have anything to... Uh... Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question. Yeah. The constellation of the mother archetype starts always with a certain, certain type of real mother. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the real mother. And that was... It, you, you know, there's the real mother and the psychological mother. Now, the real mother, uh, imagine, you know, your, your, your sister or something. She's not archetypal, you know. And yet the child can see her as her child, your sister's child, sees her as an archetypal being, you know. And so the real mother just has some influence, but what is affecting the child is, is the archetypal mother, not your sister, who's very innocent and maybe doesn't know the damage that she's causing by, you know, doing this or doing that wrong or whatever, you know. So, um, the, the, but, you know, there are real mothers who are unbelievably strong psychologically and then you're in real soup there, you know, but yes. We, I kind of skipped over that part, but I'm going to try to find out a, more about her, his mother, you know, but she was a very strong person. Marina, do you have anything? Uh, it's fascinating. I have a, I have a son who is a poor Eternus. He's, he's 30 and he's unbelievable. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not, it's not uh, like our grandson you know, is one of these sleepy ones. And when I was reading my wife about pouring a bucket of water on her, she said, right, let's do it, you know. But anyway, it just seems to be a, a, a sort of a phenomena of, the, of this age. How about you, Miles? You got any uh, comments or? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, I think that the an example that I've just recently encountered, because I started watching the Netflix production of The Crown, mm -hmm. and and there's um, in season one there's segments related to Princess Margaret, and she marries this photographer character, and I forget his name. This were in the sixties. And he's a, he's a visual artist like Tim, but unlike Tim, or maybe Tim might even go into this, I don't know, but Tim's put out a video recently, The Call of the Siren, and it shows, it's depicting him, I believe, as, a, as, as struggling to resist um, engaging into 
uh, romantic affairs, um, you know, and casual sex with the subjects. And um, and and in this um, Netflix uh, episodes of Princess Margaret and this photographer character that she ends up marrying, he's really a puer um, that uh, you know doesn't have the concept of the greater personality. And in fact, you know, uh, so very few people have the concept of a greater personality, men particularly, because, you know, it's just not part of our education. And I didn't, as I've said uh, with Skip Conover, I, I never, the word soul meant nothing to me until I encountered uh, Skip and you. And so um, therefore, you know, it's not surprising that there's such a high divorce rate of 50% because people are not being even told that there's this concept of a greater personality and that if you are a puer eternus at some stage, I think we all are, uh, you, you, you do have something to shoot for. But if you're not told that there's such a greater personality to, um, you know, try to help uh, transition into, um, this is why you're going to have all these people that are really living a very shallow life that doesn't transcend the material. Um, so anyway, um, what I'll do is I'm going to dig around in YouTube because there's actually a little documentary which is pretty factual. It's, it's actual people, historians talking about this relationship between Princess Margaret and the photographer and he basically just, um, he just was a gigolo, as you said, you know, the Puer Eternus and, and their, their marriage only, they, it was rocky for the longest time and it finally broke up after 18 years. Yeah, very, um, so anyway, I don't know just, if Tim wants to talk about, you know, his little um, video that he's presented, if that connects and relates to what I've just said, and is, is it, am I making sense? Thanks. Well, I, Tim, I hope you can put it in the chat, at least a link to it. Yeah, I'll, I'll stick it in here. Um, it's interesting to hear Miles talk about this because um, it seems, it struck me that, that in the work I do, it's a really great example of how a person can be confronted with that um, that challenge of being presented with a person who you can very easily project onto and uh, have this kind of a fantasy life that you actually carry out on another person. And in, in especially working with models, it becomes really easy to convince yourself that, oh, this is, um, this is really my projection here. You know, so that's what this film is about. You, you know the the name of 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 the 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 one who um, tempted the Buddha was named Kama Mara, and Mara had three daughters, and their names were Desire, Fulfillment, and Regret. You know, don't forget that last daughter. <laughs> I mean. You know, the, the idea of trying to make something that is uh, archetypal happen in the outer world always is, can fall flat a little bit, you know, sometimes. But anyway, um, uh, Dawn, I'm assuming you don't want to speak, but um, if I'm wrong, just speak up. Uh, Dawn usually speaks in the chat. Hi, Russell. Welcome. Uh, did you have want to uh, talk uh, at all about anything? Uh, like, have you had any? In, uh, we'll we'll have more. To, and and by the way, Russell, if you want to uh, come to our dream session, it we it's a little more open. But go ahead, Russell. Dream session. Wait. wait let's say what, what's the dream session? Oh, the dream session is at seven. PM Chicago, but I are you in, are you in Europe or where are you? I'm in Asia, Philippines. Oh, in the Philippines. So yeah, it's pretty late there. 
But yeah. it, if you want to have a special uh, session uh, sometime, I can do that too. So uh, we can keep in touch on that. But did you have anything to say about this uh, particular um, chapter? Uh, it's pretty odd at first. I don't know about this. But the uh, what is the puer actually? The, the puer? Yeah, the puer. Okay, well, the, the puer means uh, a youthful aspect. Now, uh, let, let me just say that uh, uh, it, is, it's, it is the magic of, uh, of life. You know, it's the, the most, and we're going to find that in the second half when we read the kingdom without space, how magical the puer is, you know. Uh, and you've already kind of seen it with the little prince. He's pretty magical. But I mean, basically, the, the puer is the... It, in fairy tales, it's the supernatural aspect that comes to the rescue, you know. But the, but the problem in it, when it becomes a neurotic is that if you don't ever, if it, there's no growth. For instance, it's very interesting that uh, fairies who live in the fairy hills, they have everything. They live forever. They never get sick. They got plenty of food. They never get cold. They don't have to wear anything. And yet... You'd think they didn't lack anything, but they do lack something. They steal babies, okay? human babies. And then they leave, leave a wizened old elf in its place who's called a changeling. And uh, he looks exactly like the baby and the parents can't tell that it, their baby was stolen. But why do the fairies need the baby? Because the one thing they lack is the promise of youth, you know, that aspect of the growing thing. Life is a becoming thing, you know. So the poer aspect is is that magical, divine aspect of the of growth. But the but the um, it it can also, and we're going to find in here in this book that there's both um, the a positive aspect and then the devouring aspect. But the object is to bring the positive aspect and not get eaten by the dragon, you know, uh, or the mother, you know, but bring it into the into the adult world uh, uh, and and have adapt to it. Don't have this empty adult world, but have it be have it be um, lift the curse and cure the enchantment of the adult world with the puer but don't leave the puer in the womb of the mother where most of us puer eternus is what they call this special type of young man seem to reside, the land where children never grow up. How about you, Charles? I, uh, what do you, uh, you, you're kind of a um, expert on this subject. You got anything? Yeah, um, I guess I, the first time I read Puer Eternus, it was pretty, uh, pretty crazy how accurate everything was um you know von, von franz definitely knew what she was talking about um and um you know there's actually a netflix adaptation of the little prince uh a movie animated movie of it and it's really good i highly recommend it but um yeah my my life was like a, a kind of perfect storm uh to bring about the where uh, way of living um, and while you know it definitely has its blessings and its curses um, it makes staying in one spot and actually committing to something really really difficult um, you know I, I know in the book like there's one paragraph that talks about the solution where, you know, Young just said that it's it's just work. And Bob Franz was like, well, could it really be that simple? And she's like, yeah, anyone can work if they're enthusiastic about it and have some burst of energy, but it's on a dreary, rainy morning. They have yeah, to you can't get out of into, bed. Right, right. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, it, it, it's almost like just uh, being just in a state of permanent wandering and um, it, 
um, you know, searching for genuine religious experience um, and just having such a hard time to adapt to just normal life. Um, and the things that are expected, you know, to stay in one place and work one job for however many years, it's just, um, well, I've gotten, you know, I, I've gotten close to doing that. Um, it helped the one, one job that I held the longest, um, you know, I was in love with a the girl there, so I didn't want to leave. Um, but I remember there are other, other jobs where I just, eventually I'm just like, I'm bored, I'm leaving. And I just never came back. And I just sort of um, just kept wandering. I mean, I've, I've moved, I'm about 30 years old and I've moved about 30 times. Um, and, I, and just kind of not having a permanent, um, everything's uh, the provisional life and, um, I was going to say, oh, yeah, like the idea of the elephant being swallowed by the snake. Um, um, I guess the, the really the individual personality of a person is, or, you know, for me, I'm speaking from my perspective, but um, the archetype just sort of uh, takes the main stage. And it's really difficult to kind of develop a unique personality because the archetype's really kind of in in control and um, it's just um, everything's so uh, transitory and nothing lasts um, for very long to where everything's kind of unstable and it's hard to develop um, but yeah I mean I could talk about it forever I've read this book multiple times but all I can say is that um it's, it's, this book's 100% accurate, for sure. Yeah. We'll tie it into your dreams, too, I hope. Uh, we do, uh, uh, Charles is, and Tim and, and Gary, I uh, have some pretty interesting dream series going, and we can definitely tie it in. Uh, Carl, I'd can like you to say share so something? Yeah. I'd like to share something with Charles, because I understand he's heading to Maine, and uh, I have a, a book here by a woman named Sherry Mitchell. She's with the Penobscot Indians, First Nations there in Maine. And this book, Sacred Instructions, subtitled Indigenous Women, pardon me, well, it is Indigenous Women, Indigenous Wisdom for Living Spirit-Based Change. Uh, her her um, uh, Indigenous name, I won't try to pronounce it, but it means she who brings the light. And she is with the Penobscot, as I said, and right there in Maine. And you might want to uh, research her. She's got YouTube videos. Um, she's a longtime advisor to the American Indian Institute's Healing and Future Program, currently serves as an advisor to the Indigenous Elders and Medicine People's Council of North and South America. She's the founding director of the Land Peace Foundation, an organization dedicated to global protection of indigenous rights and the preservation of indigenous way of life. Um, she's a lawyer and uh, you know many accolades. So anyway, fascinating yeah. woman and uh, just encourage you to check that out. Sure, well, that'd be great. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, Carl, uh, you're in Maine, but uh, maybe you can have something to say, but we, we got to turn it over to Gary here. Or we're not going to have any time. But uh, yeah. if you it could just say uh, uh, the uh, welcome, too. It's good to have you back, definitely. Oh, thank you. Thank, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, um, sure. yeah I mean, I, I've been in relationships with people, uh, you know, with this, um, and as well as it's something I've struggled with myself. And I think obviously like you were saying a lot of people do um i feel interestingly enough i i feel like it's like um it, it can call to you um like for instance i was i had my own business and um was used to work a lot and whatnot and you can go through different uh, traumas and it can 
it, it's something that that can kind of seduce you back. Um, I mean, in one aspect, it's healing and it's inspirational, but you don't want to get stuck in it. That's um, and what's interesting as, as well as it's funny. I had, I just read um, you know Inner Work by Robert Johnson, and then I read uh, well, before that I read um, the well not the Hillman one but the James Hall one and. And I was like, wow, this Hall, he's, you know, he knows a lot, but he's kind of an asshole <laughs> to everybody in his life, it seems. And I started reading, I've been re just listening to Hillman and there was, I started reading about him as well. And I don't know if you've read anything about him and Von Franz and, and his struggles through his life, but he, uh, this is something he struggled with a lot as well. And I think, you know, he's a brilliant guy, but um, he really tried, he uh, almost was kind of or he was, I think, trying rebelling against Young, and uh, I think the pure archetype kind of made him jealous in a way. Um, and also, it, it mentioned that his mother was a very uh, psychologically uh, kind of overbearing um, person. But and I think he also tried to. Uh, I don't know a lot about him. I've only listened to one uh, series of lectures by him on on alchemy. But interestingly enough, he kind of had a big like change in his life and where he had gone from he kind of changed from almost like a uh, Peter Pan to a Captain Hook. And in what it said in the essay was this can happen to uh, the pure um, when he's not engaging with his uh, inner work and inner transformation, um, you know, uh, from being a pure uh when he's not engaging with it consciously, it's going to happen unconsciously eventually, you know, if he doesn't, you know, die, it's a mishap. So. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, Those are the, things early, that come to mind. the early Hillman is absolutely brilliant. I, I can't say too much about the later Hillman. It gets a little Eckhart Tolle like, but the early Hillman. I is heard that. Yeah. yeah. The early Hillman Trail by is, him. yeah, yeah the, the later Hillman I don't even know what I'm reading, but the early Hillman is absolutely kick-ass. You know, yeah. I mean, it is absolutely, there's nothing like it anywhere. I mean, they, they call him the jazz musician, where Von Franz and Edinger are more classical composers. Yes. Hillman was the jazz musician. And it, it was just about like after the 80s or something. But I don't want to be talk bad about Hillman. I love Hillman. Gary, it's all no, yours. I mean, I'm yeah, go ahead, Carl. Well, you know, like, just like everybody, it just goes to show, like, um, we're all, uh, even though he was a brilliant guy, like, and he uh, obviously made great, great contributions. Like, we, like, we're all still having to deal with these things and uh, they can be overwhelming. It just it helps to, uh, I don't know, just like, even the brilliant people need some, um, uh, yeah. empathy you know and like i give him all kinds of slack i don't i i, I give him all, all kinds of slack I, i'm going to turn it over to gary now because we're really eating into his time uh it, gary has uh, usually has a little bit of an active imagination at the end so go ahead gary i'm going to just mute and... yeah actually you know i was going to say we're having such an animated discussion on this i know tim had that film that sounds like it deals with relationships i was going to say if tim wants what we could do is he could go ahead and, and take it over. We could watch the film and kind of, you know, follow up, follow up with a discussion on the film and, um, you know, continue this. So, you, know, I'm, you know, I'm certainly feeling an association with the uh, Puer myself. I think of all my projects that I put in boxes and then put in the basement, you know. <laughs> so, uh, Tim, would that be something you'd want to do? Otherwise, I'll go ahead with the uh, exercise, but we'll run a little bit over. Well, sure, I'd love to do that. In fact, I've been working on this film a couple of months, and um, I haven't really gotten any feedback on it. Uh, I, I sent it to Skip, and he put it up on YouTube. Uh, so I would love to get some reaction on it. It feels really raw to me still. Uh, it's, it's personal in a way because it talks about the, the struggle that I deal with just in um, trying to come to terms with how the feminine interacts with my artistic work. But I also feel it has these really universal uh, aspects because it, um, it points up the, 
the dual nature of having any kind of relationship with a person. There is the the authentic human being that that we have a relationship with. But then there's that incredible difficulty of trying to separate that from the projection that you feel. And in a in a uh, a really dramatic example, it becomes almost impossible to try to separate those things. So I wouldn't mind um, if we watch it. I might be able to just share my screen and, and pull it up on YouTube. Uh, let me try that. Let's see if this works. Can you see this? Yeah, I see it. Go for it. Okay. One day, a woman brushes through your life and suddenly you're snagged. Hooked. Like a fish. What's happening is you've heard the captivating song of the siren. Perhaps you recall the story from the Odyssey when Odysseus anticipates sailing past the notorious Isle of the Sirens, those dangerous erotic women who lure men to their deaths. In order to keep the sorceress song from intoxicating his men, Odysseus stuffs wax into their ears, meanwhile instructing them to tie him to the mast so that he alone can listen and to disregard his shouts and moans until long after they've passed the dangerous island, when they can safely remove the wax and untie him. I am the sculptor of human figures, and I'm one who's been extra susceptible to women's charms, often led like a bull with a ring in its nose into terrible trouble that usually cost me or my partner dearly. I felt like I'd been duped every time, the sexy allure of the woman either leading me into tragedy or leaving the woman wounded enough to warn her friends away from me. I swore I would never let it happen again. I needed to figure out a better way. So I had the plan. Being a figurative artist, I decided to hire an attractive woman as a model and observe my reactions with cool detachment as I drew her in the mood. So it is that a young, beautiful woman came to my studio, took off all her clothes and posed for me, welcoming my penetrating and mending gaze. Immediately, I felt my bloody eyes. I could hardly think of anything but taking me in my arms and making me mine. This, this is the sound of the siren. I know it well. I've been here many times. But this time, I stay my urge and tie myself to the mask, simply listening to that intoxicating sound. My fingers clutching a pencil as it drifts over the surface of a blank sheet of paper. I stab in terror at the paper, letting my desperation exhaust itself in rain and form. Time and time again, I start with a new sheet, allowing my hand to reply to the spirit of the silent song, with the song of my own. But the more I work, the more I'm worked up. I begin to sweat. The pressure is too great. I can't stand it any longer. 
I have got to take them. She's right here waiting. Hell, I hired her. And then I lost control and I dove toward that erotic song. But there I caught sight of the rocks below the siren's cliff. The rocks that would be the death of me. Painstakingly, I can learn the wise counsel that urges you, like Odysseus, to tie yourself to the mast and listen more carefully to that bewitching song the queen sing to unravel its mystery and digest the magic it contains and thus take control of your life. It's not that the sexual drive, strong as a bull, is not real and immediate. It's that there is something else accompanying that age, something ineffable, and in fact even more alluring and satisfying than simply getting the rocks out. At the end of each session, I pay the model, thank her for her work, and send her off into the gentle night. I realize I could have asked her to stay for a glass of wine and maybe we'll be dancing, but how many times have I done it only to have the siren eyes captured, lose her stunning allure, and turn into a regular mortal? What I seek is something even more shocking, more enduring, if I can only hold myself there in the time. I'll never find the secret if I can't keep from being snagged by the lure. If only I could hold myself there in that tension. There is yet another story to be told. If only. If only. Bravo. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Thank you. So wonderful mixture of, of the, you know, the, the manifestation of the creative in your concrete art and the interplay of the inner world. But go ahead. Is Gary or can you hear me? Yeah, I don't know. So, so some of that was breaking up, but I, I do have a question for Tim. So at one point, you know, you, you go forward, like, you you know, the audience is kind of like, oh, we're going to go embrace her or something. But no, it's that you literally kind of need to tie yourself to the mast and you view the, the wedding ring. And that's the rock that, you know, could break you. Could you give a little more context on that? Well, um, I wanted to, my first script 
sort of didn't have a climax. It was just about, oh, there's something deeper. And then I realized that it's, it's got to have a, a breaking point. And I came up with this kind of metaphor of using the wedding ring as the rock. It doesn't matter what the rock is, but there's always a point when you try to, uh, when you try to embrace the, um, the divine where, where it will break you if you don't come to the realization that what you're dealing with is your own encounter with the self and not, um, uh, you, can, you can never embrace the, uh, you know, the divine. And somebody had just mentioned Robert Johnson's book, He. There's another one that I think really nails this, and that's his, his book on She, which is the, the story of the romantic um, obsession that has been the truth of Western culture since the 12th century, where we have this idea that there's this romantic partner that is going to be our, our kind of savior in this life. And if we can only find the right partner, we'll, we'll be in heaven. And in that myth, I know that a lot of you know this, of, of Tristan and Isolde, Tristan falls in love with this, with this princess, Isolde, and, you know, steals her and takes her out into the woods and has this wonderful affair with her. But she's being stolen from the king, who is his best friend. And the king comes and, and uh, captures them and takes the, the princess back for him to wed her. And Tristan is, is um, uh, exiled and has to go live across the ocean in a different country. And he marries another real woman whose name is also Isolde, Isolde of the White Hands. And this is a perfect metaphor for this, for this uh, dichotomy because what you fall in love with is, is the mythical character that you cannot capture. And the one that you get to live with is the real person who gets to be your, your partner in this world. But you have to make the distinction between those two things. And I've always... Um, as an adult, I became sort of interested in this idea. It, it seems to me that the human psyche calls for us to have two spouses. One is the real person that you take home and you sleep with and, and is your partner. And the other is this kind of mythical character that serves as inspiration that you know is never to be found on earth, but is... Um, but is um, apparent in people that you, that you meet, but has to be approached as a spiritual character. So in this film, I'm trying to bring that out. I'm trying to, to say that even though you see this, this absolutely fascinating person and it feels like because they have a body, you can grab them and take them home. That's just not the case. You have to tie yourself to the mast, listen to the song, and say, okay, that's my, my inspiration speaking. That is the, the terrifying aspect of beauty, that it can en enliven and make me just burn, make my hair light on fire. But I can never take that, take that home. It's always going to be a spiritual creature. Something that happened inside you you know, it didn't happen in in her or in uh, like the, uh, you know, the you you have a beautiful artwork by Cezanne or Monet or somebody, and uh, you show it to a group of cows, you know, and they don't seem to be very moved by it, you know. So I mean, the the fact that it awakens energy in us. Tells us, uh, you know, I think it, it, in, it was in the black book. Somebody said, you know, know, know the woman within you, not the, it's more important to know the woman within you than the woman without you. I mean, 
what is being awoken in you by the energy? You know, and then my one, my wife really says that's where I really come out, you know, as a poer that I never ever take for granted the uh, uh, I do I'm doing it better as I get older. D take for granted the magic of uh, um, of a uh, of the uh, of the other the feminine that's not me you know it always is, catches me by surprise you know even even in a very matronly person how nice she is to me she just met met me you know and she's making sure every little thing's taken care of. you know now, I I've known a couple of men that would do that you know at one time I was working with some guy uh, and where did he go? And I look and about uh, 50 yards across this auditorium, he's helping the cooks bring these uh, pots back into the kitchen. You know, he's this little bodhisattva, you know, but the, um, yeah, you know, it's just amazing uh, the, the energy that is awoken in us. There's also that energies in the outer world. I, I say it is, you know, too. I can just see it, especially in, in go ahead. Here. In the you know in the as in the film you know you can see both the uh, you know the projection that he's having on the woman you know and the intensity of his sketching and yet the you know and yet there's inspiration there as well yeah you know, and because you know it's now becoming a form of art so it's really it's really both you know positive and, and negative poles if you will um, because. It's going, you know, it's, it's causing them to reach the heights and depths, and yet there's a huge projection there as well. And so then, you know, and so then there's the realization as he goes towards the woman that can't actually be had. And, and you know, it's more like, no, you actually have to hold the tension and tie yourself to the post. You, you know, Gary, I would just say, it just as far as, as practical dreams of the feminine, some of the ones you've had have been really good. Mm. You know, I mean, the, the one where the anima is, is picking partners, but she doesn't include me, you know? Right, right. <laughs> I mean, it, it's just, it's very interesting, mm. this relationship. And my anima, I, I, the only time I would ever see her would be when lightning would flash outside. I'd see her in the darkness, looking, glaring in at me, you know, because right. I was. Uh, one thing that makes the, the video, the production makes me think of is we're in, in, enculturated into the concept of monogamy as pretty much the expected paradigm to with, live within insofar as the most of the uh, the world is concerned and uh, yet you know if uh, with divorce rates at 50 percent and then thinking well then the, even the 50 percent that is still sticking together uh, what percentage are actually happy it we have to, we should really have the conversation um, as upsetting as it is to ask well is there something we should be doing differently you know insofar as it's not really working uh, personally I am I guess by good fortune and luck in in I think a very stable monogamous marriage uh, for the whole I expect the rest of my life um, but anyway um, I do know there are some people starting to think about the dynamics, the energy between male and female as, uh, you know, not working. And when you think about it, we are, our population has, has gone, you know, skyrocketing. We're now at 8 billion people and we have to, we have to figure this energy out <laughs> because it's, it's, uh, it's not working. Um, and uh, yet you're, you know, to even open up the conversation people hearing me saying what I'm saying will be like, oh my God, you know, you're, you know, probably have all sorts of names for me, right? Um, but anyway, that's, uh, but the other thing too, I'll just add to finish with is, um, I'm sort of left wondering, well, what is she doing presenting herself as a nude model 
to someone uh, when she's obviously either married or uh, in a serious relationship. Um, so in other words, the model is also, well, she is the siren and she's sort of like setting that artist up for the fall, maybe purposefully, I don't know. Well, I can speak to that a little bit because actually the experience of modeling is very powerful for people. And it's, it's one of the few times in your life when you, um, if you take off all your clothes and stand before another person, um, you are being totally honest. And, uh, and of course, almost all of us have body issues and we're just terrified that we're, that we're not gonna be good enough. And American culture is all about um, dramatizing that, that uh, conflict. But the fact is, as, a, as an artist, I began to realize that when somebody presents themselves as a model, as a nude model, it's one of the few times when I know that there's someone presenting themselves as honest and, and as being totally frank with me. And it's a very powerful experience because that's a challenge. You know, if the, the model is saying, okay, here I am in my, all of my totality, who the hell are you? And, and you, once, you, once you hear that question, you can't back off and say, okay, I'm not gonna do this anymore. I'm just gonna draw a shape. So it becomes a very, very powerful encounter between two human beings. And so I would say the model, regardless of what her personal relationships is, she, he or she shows up and, and presents themselves. It is, it is like throwing down the gauntlet. You know, I am being totally authentic with you. What are you doing? We had one at college. I was in art class in college. And, you know, it never seemed that, you know, I, for an 18 year old guy just going to college, it was pretty shocking at first, but boy, after, after a few, of course, this was in an open college, you know. I, the only thing we were a bunch of, of uh, people from the country and our art professor was from New York and he thought we were being, we weren't being correct enough about the models, either the male or the female. And so then everybody started dramatically exaggerating everything. <laughs> it was pretty funny, but anyway. Uh, well, thank you, Annetta and, uh, uh, and Russell and Carl and everybody. And uh, next time we'll just uh, go to the second lecture and uh, we'll just keep at it until, uh, uh, you, you know, it go, go, it, it's gonna be very instructive to our dreams as well, I think. I, think yeah, I have yeah. a comment. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Carlos. Uh, I think this is a, a different archetype. One is the witch, sorcerer, and the other is the, the devouring mother. Are two different. This, this, now, what was the first one, the sorcerer? Yes, the witch, yeah. sorcerer. Yeah, this, the witch. The other one is different, is the, the, the devouring mother. Yeah, yeah, the next time uh, I'm going to put that diagram of that Neumann had of, of the, the, the sorcerer or the old witch, you know, and then the young witch, and then the more transformative feminine, and then the great mother in the middle. And I think it'll kind of tell us more about the, what, who the boa constrictor is, you know, and, and who the elephant is and where this is happening. You know, so. And I also ask uh, a little bit about that movie. I found it beautiful, Tim. Yeah. But I also think it's a mutual call. Like the, the, the call is mutual, for, for, of course, for the model yes. as well. And, um, and, and I can imagine that, it, that that is quite liberating to go into that fantasy, as you were saying. You know, it is, it is a liberating act, I would imagine. Yeah. Yes, and the script was great. It was fabulous. I'm going to rewatch it this afternoon. So, and and anyway, well, thank you everybody for coming. And uh, I'll, Russell, I'll be in touch with you about the dream book. Book. Thank you, Miles too. Nice to see you. And and Carl too. And Charles and Dawn, and Marina too. Uh, well, and Gary. Next time you'll Gary's 
going to do his uh, exercise next time then. Thank you for being so generous. Bye, everyone. Gary. Yeah, go ahead, Marina. Okay, bye, bye Marina. See you later.